Junior, I've got something difficult to tell you about Princess Peach. I know, she's not really my mama. Wait, what? Super Mario Sunshine! Woohoo! Alright, so check this out, guys. Check this out. Hot take coming through right here. Super Mario Sunshine is a divisive game. I know, right? I know. How absolutely hysterical I must be to say something like that. What groundbreaking, earth-shattering knowledge I just dropped on you all. Craziness. So, besides stating the obvious, what else is there to say about Sunshine? Well, it's weird as f***. It basically follows the trend that all AAA titles for the Nintendo GameCube followed at the time, and that's doing the opposite of what everybody expects it to do. Exhibit A. <laughs> Power-up complete. Yeah, so in a massive heel turn by Nintendo, they decided to shake the foundations of 3D Mario by attaching you at the hip to this guy, Flood. A water-powered jetpack slash spray nozzle hybrid who also happens to talk. Data storage complete. I am Flood, a flash liquidizer ultra-dousing device. Huh, <laughs> okay, that's enough out of you. Thank you for purchasing this item from Gab Science Incorporated, preparing to register- Okay, seriously, shut up. So, the addition of Flood in Mario Sunshine is arguably the most prominent source of contention amongst fans when it comes to the game's reception. The reason being for starters is that Flood is a requirement. You are forced to use him throughout the game when it comes to spraying enemies or objects, using the jetpack to reach high places, or triggering mechanisms. It's just so odd that Mario would ever use something like this to get shit done. He's Mario. He generally has been able to handle most situations without any assists aside from the occasional temporary power-up. But now he just kind of carries around a water sprayer thingy? It feels almost out of place in the Mario universe. But I'm getting ahead of myself here. Because Flood is only one piece to the enigmatic puzzle that is Super Mario Sunshine, as there is a lot to unpack with this particular title. The fact remains, Super Mario Sunshine is no doubt the black sheep of the mainline Mario games. Some fans absolutely love it, and some absolutely loathe it. It sits in this awkward middle ground where it receives nothing but rave reviews by critics, but then gets verbally pooped on by fans. It's in the same camp as games like Banjo-Tooie, Rayman 3, or Sonic CD, which coincidentally are all games I've covered on this channel. And you should also check those videos out, they're great. So as is tradition with games like this, I'm going to dissect Mario Sunshine and determine whether or not it deserves the hate it gets, or whether or not it deserves better. Ah, ah, he said it, he said it. So remember back in the days of Super Mario 64, how you had Peach's castle as your main hub world? It was this big open structure with lots of rooms and secrets for you to explore, but at the same time it felt empty and lifeless in an unnerving sort of way, as if these rooms and halls should be bustling with people and activity but they're not. And then there's the paintings you can jump through to access the game's levels, acting as portals to other worlds completely separated from the main castle. It felt like this world you were venturing through wasn't even real, like you were traveling through a purgatory or dream of some type. There was also no world building to speak of here due to how disconnected everything felt. Super Mario Sunshine's hub world on the other hand, Isle Delfino, actually feels like a real place. It's a tropical vacation getaway filled with buildings, architecture, people, culture, all things you would find within an actual real life community. And that's comforting to the player, having an actual town to explore filled with real people doing things you would actually expect them to do in a tropical setting like this. It makes you want to engage with the setting more, and you can do so by talking to the inhabitants and learning more about their culture, or by scaling buildings in search of secrets. You can help out various villagers by collecting fruit for them. You can even ride a boat around the island if you want. There's just so much life here, so much going on, so much activity. It makes the experience of traveling between stages less of a chore and more of a relaxing intermission. Isle Delfino is one of my all-time favorite hub worlds because of how full of life it is. 
I also love how the stages you can access from here, aside from a select few, don't feel disconnected from the island at all. After all, you can literally see in the distance some of these stages that you are traveling to. I absolutely adore this type of world building because it reminds you how big the setting truly is. The main hub, after all, is only one small section of this huge island you're on, and each stage you enter is its own section somewhere else on the island. That's just crazy! The stages themselves are no slouches either. The common denominator between all these stages is that they are all tropical themed. Now, many players will complain that this lack of originality between stages mean that none of them really stand out or leave a lasting impression, but that is where I tell you to shut your mouth. Yes, every stage in Mario 64 is distinct. You've got snowy worlds, fire worlds, water worlds, the whole works, and every stage is memorable in its own way. The problem here, though, is that all these distinctive, unique worlds feed back into that same feeling of disconnection I mentioned before. There's no through line between Mario 64 stages, and as a result, it breaks the immersion. I mean, you've got to admit that going from an ice world straight into a fire world feels jarring to a degree. It reminds you that you're playing a level created for a video game. And you should never feel like you're playing a video game when you're playing a video game. I would rather have every stage be similar in setting and build more toward one cohesive universe than have each level act as its own segment that has no real effect on any other part of the game other than the fact that it's a level that has stuff in it for you to collect. I mean, cause at the end of the day, Wet Dry World has no real lasting impact on Peach's castle. It's just a vessel for the gameplay to, well, play out, whereas Rico Harbor has more purpose beyond that, acting as this epicenter for all things shipping related to take place on the island. The inhabitants of Isle Delfino would not have the wide variety of fruits at their disposal if it wasn't for this area, methinks. So here's something I forgot to talk about, the story. As a whole, there ain't really much to say here. Mario tries to take a vacation, but ends up being blamed for Isle Delfino being completely covered in some weird sketchy paint. And so now he has to use Flood to clean it all up and clear his name, while also collecting all the scattered shine sprites that were lost in the mess. As for the actual perpetrator of this whole thing, it's a mysterious figure known as Shadow Mario. Now, at first glance, this new concept of a character is so cool. Shadow Mario is this menacing doppelganger of Mario that we initially don't know much about, other than the fact that he looks like Mario, walks like Mario, and talks like Mario. That is to say, not much at all. But one thing Shadow Mario does have over regular Mario is his presence. He's got this menacing, blank stare that immediately gives the impression that he could do some serious damage despite his small size. He feels like a legitimate threat to Mario, and the first impression he leaves at the start of the game is all you really need to know about him. Princess, look! On the statue's head! Mario? Yeah, the whole beginning section of the game really does a perfect job at showcasing that Shadow Mario is going to be a serious threat, possibly the biggest threat Mario has faced thus far due to how much trouble he gives him from the start. The potential here for Shadow Mario was limitless at this point in the game, as it really felt like we were finally getting a Shadow to Mario's Sonic, or a Vegeta to Mario's Goku. You know, that one foe that either matches or slightly exceeds the abilities of the main character, thus establishing this ultimate rivalry between them? That was the case initially with Shadow Mario. Until they went and completely ruined him in one fell swoop. Excuse me, what the f Are you fucking kidding me? You mean to tell me this whole time Shadow Mario wasn't this badass, uber powerful force of nature? That he wasn't the ultimate rival for Mario who would cap off the game with one final epic confrontation? That he was just a kid wearing a bib? This entire sequence basically killed any credibility Shadow Mario had, and furthermore, kinda acted as the low point in the game's plot. Pretty much 
any mystery or intrigue the story had up to this point had all been wiped out in one slow, plotting cutscene that involves a wall of exposition, where Bowser Jr. for some reason decides to reveal literally everything to Mario. He reveals that he was the one behind this entire mess on Isle Delfino, and that he posed as Shadow Mario in order to get the heat off himself and onto the real Mario. He also drops a massive bombshell that his dad, the real OG Bowser, in a stroke of excellent parenting I might add, explained to him that Princess Peach is his biological mother, and that Mario is a bad man who is holding her captive. So basically, in one measly cutscene, this game's story went from a unique whodunit mystery novel with a lot of potential to a soap opera. The worst part is this cutscene happens after you've collected only 10 shine sprites. And keep in mind, you need at minimum 50 of these guys to complete the game, meaning that this game only has a good story for about one-fifth of its runtime. That's only 20%! And then the other 80% is pretty much nothing, as every major plot point set up at the beginning of the game for you to discover on your own had all been just given to you verbally in one cutscene. God. What a terribly paced soap opera this has become. Hey, at least they didn't turn it into a sitcom. Can you imagine Mario with a laugh track? <laughs> so, now that this game's plot has all but eroded before our eyes, what substance is left in Mario Sunshine to fill in the gaps? Well, a lot of frustrating shine sprites to collect, and some frustrating controls. Here's the thing. These controls aren't terrible. In fact, I would argue they feel a lot smoother than Mario 64's. Mario feels slower here than in 64, but that's honestly for the better, because it allows you more leeway to pull off some slick parkour moves during the tighter platforming sections. And there's also less risk of sending Mario flying into the abyss on accident because of how slippery he is. The problem with Sunshine's controls rears its ugly head mainly during the platforming sections, where you don't have access to Flood. It feels as if there's a slight delay in Mario's jump, and it's noticeable whenever you try to jump across two platforms. You're running along, you hit the A button, and to your surprise, Mario is plummeting into the void, even though you swear on Bowser Jr.'s mama that you timed the jump correctly. Mario. Quiet, you. This happened to me in numerous times, and all within the same situation of trying to make a jump across two platforms. It just feels like he should have jumped right there, but didn't. I don't know, maybe I just suck or something. Feel free to tell me in the comments below how much I suck. When it comes to collecting the shine sprites, and this is speaking more on the game's difficulty curve than anything else, it is initially a freaking joke. The first 30 to 40 shines are the easiest thing in the world to get, minus one or two of them. The game's got you doing some real basic stuff early on, like collecting red coins, reviving dead sunflowers, tearing bloopers limb from limb literally, racing a grown-ass adult in a Barney costume who's also a complete pushover. It's all super smooth, easygoing stuff, almost to a fault. You would think that with Sunshine having far fewer levels than Mario 64 does, that its shine sprites would be a bit more... involved? Some of these really do feel like a waste of time to collect, such as the 8 red coins in the Reef sprite in Gelato Beach, which serves basically no challenge to the player, or the one in Bianco Hills where you have to fight the giant piranha plant a second time, but the only difference is she just flies around the map aimlessly. Yeah, not the most inspiring gameplay here. But then, as if from nowhere, this game turns heel again and makes its last 15 or so shines just the most obnoxious thing in the world. Now, I'm not complaining here and saying this game becomes way too hard, because these aren't the respectable kind of challenges that actually test your skills. Rather, these are the annoying types of challenges that slow you down for the sake of slowing you down. It's an old trope that games of a bygone era used to use where they would do whatever they could to inconvenience the player, even if it was just completely stupid. There's the mysterious Hotel Delfino shine where you have to find the right fruit for Yoshi hidden in this hotel so that he can eat the giant booze blocking your path to the room with the shine in it. The problem is that if you drop down into the wrong room from the attic and there's a door blocking your path, you're screwed. Because for some reason you can't open doors while riding Yoshi. So you have to just leave him there, but 
You better make sure he dies before you leave the room, otherwise the door will lock behind you and Yoshi will just be chilling in that room and you'll have to go all the way back around and drop down into that room and get him to despawn because otherwise you can't get to the shine sprite without him. And since he's stuck in that room, you can't get anywhere until he respawns in the downstairs lobby. Or how about the casino shine where you have to spray this ridiculous wall puzzle to resemble a shine sprite? Oh, this one takes the cake. This. This is the absolute worst. Having to account for the water splashing into other squares and completely messing up the puzzle when you're only one away from completing the whole thing. Basically, this game's difficulty curve has no middle ground. It goes from stupid easy to complete bullshit. Good luck trying to win the biggest watermelon contest in Gelato Beach, you masochists. Question for y'all. Would you believe me if I told you I actually still had some nice things to say about this game after all that? Well, it's time for the more positive portion of the video. I mean, because that's what the series is all about, right? We take a look at games that are hated as well as adored. Games that really stir things up. Games that create a discussion. Controversy seemingly follows Super Mario Sunshine wherever it may go. Is it mainly because of the addition of Flood? Mario, was I, um, assist- Yes, yes, possibly. Is it because of the lack of variety between stage settings? Maybe. Is it because of the bugginess that may occur during certain segments of the game? Yeah, you know which ones I'm talking about. Mamma mia, there's just so much here that I could sit and nitpick all day. But here's the thing, Mario Sunshine, well, it's got something the other Mario games don't have. An X Factor, if you will. It's not in any one thing, but rather an amalgamation of everything. It's the absolute god-tier music that matches up perfectly with the tropical settings of Noki Bay or Pianta Village. It's the natural evolution of Mario's platforming style with the addition of Flood. It's the perfectly timed secret stages that show up just in time to shake up the gameplay a little bit. Seriously, man, I love these stages. They keep you on your toes so that you're not completely relying on Flood to cheese every platforming section, because real talk, that's what most of us are using Flood for. But hey, I think that's awesome. Flood allows for much more dynamic platforming in Mario. Now it's no longer just jumping off walls, but rather jumping off walls and then jetpacking your way to a ledge. You can move around these maps so much more easily now. The little techniques like spraying water in front of you so you can glide along at extremely high speeds is just exquisite. And scaling huge gaps between platforms? That's no longer an issue around here. Mastering Flood's mechanics opens up a whole new world of possibilities with Mario's platforming that people don't talk enough about. I love it. And you know what? I'm just gonna say it. I love you, Flood. As long as you don't talk. I feel like I'm Spider-Man being able to scale across buildings and run along rooftops thanks to Flood. It's just the amount of agency you get with this contraption. Being able to glide around these open maps with ease and scale whatever structures are in front of you in seconds. I mean, I don't know what else to say. It just makes this game pure fun to play compared to other platformers. This is a weird sentence to spout, but there's so much charisma in the platforming. And the movement. There's no extended segment in this game that feels boring to play, as long as you stay away from the blue coin challenges, that is. And that's because of the flexibility you have with moving around. Even a mission as simple as Road to the Big Windmill in Bianco Hills, where you literally just have to make it from point A to point B, is fun. Because of all the different ways you have to get there. You can spray some water in front of you and glide at mock speeds down the first hill and jump onto the clothesline in front of you, use it to spring up to the rooftops and go roof jumping, or you can cut through the water canal, hitch a ride on the windmill, jump along the treetops, or just take the basic path laid out in front of you. All these possibilities exist within every mission of this game. You can tackle any level in any way you want due to the openness of every stage combined with the powers that be strapped to your back. The boss fights here are completely inoffensive as well. I appreciate how varied they are. In one fight, you're stripping a blooper of his tentacles so that he can't crush you with them, in another, you're underwater trying to clean a giant eel's teeth. And in another, you're spinning slots with King Boo and trying to kill him with fruit. It's a variety like this that harkens back to that X factor I mentioned earlier. You just don't see variety like this often, and you don't see it in this many creative ways. Even the eight red coin challenges are made interesting from time to time. 
with one taking place on top of a giant sandbird suspended high up in the sky. The seemingly simple task of grabbing eight red coins sitting on this one bird is made much more challenging by the fact that the bird will occasionally rotate its wingspan without warning. But hey, that ish don't phase me. I'm basically Spider-Man anyways, bitch. <sighs> Alright, so I said some good stuff and some bad. I said a lot of things that people will agree with, and I said a lot of things that will make people mad. But hey, none of that's my fault. Blame the game, if anything. Super Mario Sunshine, why are you like this? Super Mario Sunshine is such a puzzle to me that despite everything I've rattled off for the past however many minutes, I'm still not sure what exactly it is about this game that makes me love it so much. Because I do. I love Super Mario Sunshine. It's so much more interesting to me than Mario 64. 64 is a classic, don't get me wrong, but the disconnected feeling in its levels and lack of substance in its hub world hurts the experience for me. Sunshine doesn't feel like a video game, but rather an immersive experience. I love getting to know the Piantas and their way of life. I love how massive this island feels and I love exploring it, and the platforming is some of the best it's been in any Mario game. Super Mario Sunshine reminds me a lot of a certain Sonic game, one that chose not to fit the mold of its predecessors and forged ahead with its own weirdness, despite how out of character it may have been. Mario Sunshine is the same way. I think people just have a hard time understanding it because it's not what was expected. It's weird, it's off-kilter, it's oddly paced, and sometimes it's frustrating as hell. But it's all good because I consistently had fun playing it, yes, consistently even at the aggravating parts. That is why I truly believe Super Mario Sunshine deserves better. Because above all else, Super Mario Sunshine feels like a vacation. And... The vacation starts now.